this is, I don't know why this has been on my mind, but it has. Um, I just felt like God would have me preach and teach about hell. Um, part of what led me uh, to, th especially this particular passage in Luke, and if I don't, if I don't get done, what if I don't get done with my notes this morning? I'll, I'll either carry it on next Sunday or this evening. But um, I'm going to take my time here. Take your time, okay? Let's learn what we can about what happens when a person dies. Somebody reached out to me a while back. And I've talked about this online. Um, I'm keeping the, the person's name out of it. But they reached out to me about an issue that they had a question about. They said that before they got saved, it, it was a woman. And she said when she was about 15 years old, her and her older brother, who was 18, got into a pretty bad fight. Sort of like me and my sister used to get into. And um, mom would give us castor oil for fighting. You ever had castor oil? Imagine drinking motor oil. It was punishment. Very effective. So much so that we thought about hiding the bottle on her. Because we figured something that evil, there's, surely there's only one bottle on the whole planet. But anyway, her and her brother got into a fight. And words were said to the effect of, I don't ever want to see you again. I never want to talk to you ever again. That happens in families. It's regrettable. It's bad. But that happens in families. And she said not too long after that, her brother that she got into a fight with died. I don't remember if he was killed or something happened, but he, he died. And... Immediately, her heart went back to that moment where she saw him walk out the door for the very last time with the words being said, I don't want to see you again. I don't want everyone to talk to you again. Sometimes we have to live with regrets that we don't want to live with. Sometimes we do. So... I don't know what got her in this direction, but she ended up going to see a psychic. Now, a psychic is what the Bible calls someone who hath a familiar spirit. You might want to write that down and look that up in your Bible. There's multiple places. I talked about it this week on Pastor Mike Online. I've Teach, taught on it before, uh, try to go through every place in the Bible where the Bible teaches about familiar spirits so you get to know what you're dealing with. Now, I will say this, that a lot of, a lot of so-called psychics, card readers, astrologers, palm readers are nothing but fakes, phonies, fortune cookie, fortune cookie writers. They can write up anything in the world and you can make it like, boy, that's true. Um, she told me that the psychic told her things about her and her brother that only her and her brother knew. And I said, well, there's, there's two answers to that. There's two possible answers to that. One of them is, 
you gave him the information without you being aware of it. And I've seen how that works. I've studied. I've just had an interest in magicians and people like that all my life. I, I wanna, if I see them do a trick, I want to know how they did that trick. And uh, some people get fooled. I get people sending me stuff every now and then saying, boy, you got to watch this video, Mike. I believe this person's really doing satanic magic. And I've seen the tricks before. I know how it's done. I mean, I hate to let them down, but it's, it's a, they manipulated something and they fooled you. It's, not, a, it's not, a, not really magic. It's just a trick. There's some that do that, but there's no doubt in my mind, according to the scriptures, that there are some people who are uh, working with what the Bible calls a familiar spirit. So, in the course of talking to this psychic, this medium, she was convinced that this person was in contact with the spirit of her deceased brother based on something that he had said to her or whatever she was convinced of it and and said the the psychic told her uh your brother is here and he's telling me that he loves you that he forgives you and he's in a good place now and he looks forward to seeing you once again. He's always going to be there with you. But he loves you and he forgives you and it's all over with. Well, you can imagine the emotion this young lady went through. Tears running down her eyes. And, and she told me it just felt like a big weight had been taken off of me. I felt at peace and so on. And she made a statement and said that I don't, I don't believe the devil can give you peace so that it had to be from God. But let me ask you, do you believe the devil can manipulate your emotions and make you feel certain positive, good emotions on a temporary basis. Who believes that? Raise your hand. Of course he does. If the devil could not please our emotions and our flesh, we wouldn't follow him. If he didn't give us some sense of satisfaction, we wouldn't sin. We wouldn't do any of that stuff. We'd stay away from that. that man, every time I get mixing that with it, I, I read a book of a man that had been in the New Age movement. He started out, he was taught how to meditate, and he was taught then how to get in contact with what he believed were the, the masters who ran the universe. They were the, uh, the ascended masters, they called them. And he was in contact with them, and every day that he would fall into this deep meditation and communicate with them, he always felt at peace, he felt bliss, a, a euphoria, sort of like getting high or getting, getting drunk, the buzz of marijuana or cocaine, or alcohol or whatever, that feeling of euphoria, he was getting that without drugs from these spirits. And after a while, spending time every day with these spirits, there was one day when he didn't meditate. He got busy doing something, forgot about it, whatever. And in his dreams that night, they tormented him. And the next day when he meditated, he began to see a different side to them that he had never seen before. They were not just asking him to be in contact. They were demanding his presence. And he said, I could see that they were taking more and more and more out of my life. And he said, I, I found myself 
meditating every day not to get that joy and that bliss anymore but just to stay alive because I thought they could kill me he finally gave his life to the Lord he wrote the book and was mysteriously killed imagine that but that's what devils do that's how they operate it always starts out good at the beginning and it crashes very quickly at the end so here's how I I counseled this lady I said let me ask you a question in your do you believe that your brother was born again she said well none of us were at the time I said I'm gonna show you in the scriptures that was not your brother that it could not have been your brother regardless of what that medium or that psychic said and how he convinced you with something that only you and your brother know my sister and I we have secrets that goes all the way back to our childhood that if she died or I died and somebody came to her and said Melissa your brother has been in contact with me from the dead and he told me this and this and this and this and she would be like how in the world did you know that but I'm going to show you I'm going to read to you what I read to her that day let me let me make it unmistakably clear the moment that you close your eyes for the very last time on this earth and draw your last breath your spirit nor your soul hangs around on the earth to complete unfinished business or to reconcile differences or to let you know where Uncle Billy buried all of his treasure then you find out it was Confederate money Luke chapter 16 verse 19 you believe the Bible say amen if somebody else told you something different would you believe the Bible say amen there was a certain rich man now I had the Jehovah's Witness on my porch one day and I told him I said uh, you can tell me all I said let me ask you a question do you not believe in a literal burning hell that people endure for all of eternity and they said no that's just the grave and I said well let me tell you there was a certain rich man and they uh, they said oh we know that Jesus taught in parables and parables were make-believe stories I said there's your wrong right there he did not say let's pretend there was a rich man he didn't say let's make believe there was a rich man he said there was a certain rich man Jesus knew who this man was you believe that say amen you believe when, when par parables are not fables we have not used cunningly devised fables this story is real there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table moreover the dogs came and licked his sores and it came to it's the only medicine that he had was dogs and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom let's stop and let's pray we haven't prayed we haven't prayed yet really we prayed for the tithes and offering but let's pray father I pray dear God that 
this message would be taken seriously. Father, there's a lot of junk happening in the world right now. People are wrapped up and caught up in all sorts of fairy tales, fables, myths, urban legends, um, anecdotes, memes, internet rumors, social media has pretty much become the core now of our civilization and it changes just about every two weeks and it's led billions of people astray and father you know what's in man's heart you have people believing the earth is flat you have people believing in this conspiracy theory and that conspiracy theory and wrapped up and caught up in Hollywood people's lives and who does this and who does what and we're caught up in everything about this world and father one thing I have not seen is I have not seen hardly anybody warning people about an everlasting hell father your word teaches us to not be afraid of the one who can kill the body but to fear the one who can kill both body and soul Father, I pray, dear God, that those who hear, whether it's just one message or you make two or three out of it, doesn't matter to me. Father, there, there cannot be enough preached about the everlasting fires of hell. We cannot be warned enough. We cannot be reminded enough. We cannot be thankful enough, those of us who by your grace are not going there. Father, when I think of hell, I get the shudders. It scares me. It scares me to think that I could be headed there. And then go on and live my life as if it doesn't matter. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would do a wonderful work in somebody's life. Even, Father, somebody that despises me, somebody that doesn't like me, doesn't like anything I say, they don't believe anything I teach on. God, would you let them just listen to this one message? Lord, open up our hearts and help us, dear God, so that we first can escape the fiery wrath of God, but that also we can warn others of the same. So, Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless your word today. And bless your humble servant. I thank you, God, for reminding me of the fires of hell. And God, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there ever. Have mercy on me, Father. Have mercy on these people. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. First question I want to ask you is, how long was it from the moment Lazarus the beggar died until the angels showed up and carried not his physical body because Lazarus was a beggar a poor man they probably had a a, a beggars a pauper's graveyard Jefferson County has one I know somebody that's buried there and it's a it's a sad life it's somebody whose life was spent 
almost totally on drugs, in and out of so many beds they couldn't keep count. Uh, this lady was about a year older than me, and she had done so much damage in her life and throughout her life that when she died, not even her family wanted to deal with it, and they put her in a pauper's grave in Jefferson County. So I imagine that probably somebody who was responsible for that just picked up Lazarus' dead body after a few days and it started stinking the neighborhood up. They just grabbed his body and took it and threw it in the grave. What difference does it make? He's not going to use it anymore. Just throw it away. But how long do you think it took before the angels got there to take Lazarus to Abraham's bosom? How long was Lazarus after his death surviving this this world how long was he around instantaneously the moment he drew his last breath the angels of God were there to minister to him and to gently carry him into a place and I've re talked about this before I'm not going to get too deep into Abraham's bosom but the mere fact that it mentions bosom, that is always a place of comfort and rest for people. Whether you're a little baby or whether you are friends and, and brethren and we come together and we hold together people that we love in our, in our bosom, husbands and wives holding arm in arm, uh, walking together, laying together. My wife goes to sleep every night her head right here on my bosom. That's where I find comfort. She finds comfort. And that's where Lazarus was immediately after his death. No unfinished business. There, there wasn't like he was saying, no, wait a minute. I've always wanted to sit at the rich man's table and he's not there anymore. Can I eat some of his food? None of that. Immediately he was carried into a place of rest. And no more sores. Amen. No more dogs licking him. No more hunger. No more wasting away. He's in a place, immediately in a place of comfort. But now let's look at the rich man. In verse, um, uh, let's see here, verse 22. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, boom, there was no time, there was no expanse of time, there was an unfinished business. He did not roam the halls of his house, shaking chains, blowing out candles, moving furniture, slamming cupboard uh, doors or anything like that. He went immediately to a place where the Bible says one thing about him. He was in torment. No second chance. No prayers. Nothing. And by the way, he bypassed purgatory. He must not have heard about that one, Gary. There is no such place as purgatory. That's a lie out of hell that the devil made up. 1.2 billion, probably more than that, people in this world believe that there is a mediary place that you go to to purge off remainders of sins so that you can be good enough to go to heaven. That in itself is a lie. It's all a lie. When you leave this world, the Bible makes it very clear as it is appointed unto men once to die. Where is that? Romans chapter, I think, um, oh, let's see here. What is it? Romans chapter 6 or Romans chapter 3. Uh, as it is appointed unto man. No, 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 no. Romans 6 maybe. Yeah, I can't find it. But the Bible says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. 
Your soul, your spirit does not remain on this earth to finish unfinished business, to reclaim lost things, or to be in contact with other people. That is a familiar spirit. I'll teach on that some other time. But that's basically a devil who knows, Melissa, the secrets that you and I share from our childhood that nobody else is going to find out, not even our mama. Especially mama. And I hope God don't tell her when it's her time to go either. But the moment, the moment you die, you will immediately enter into one of two places. You will either stand, well, you will stand before God in judgment. And God will look at you and ask, is his name written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world? And when an angel says, his name is written, God says, well done, my faithful servant. Enter into the joys of our Lord. Somebody say amen. We're going to heaven one of these days. But to the rest, in judgment God sees their works their unconfessed unrepented sins and an angel who looks through the book for their name does not find it and says his name is not written and God says depart from me ye cursed ones into in fact turn to Matthew 20 Five. Matthew 25. I am, I am going to make this a, a little mini-series. Is that okay? You didn't say no, so I'm, that's a vote of approval. Matthew chapter 25. This is when Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats. When you look in verse 37, the righteous which are the sheep, the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto, uh, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then, then look down at verse forty-four. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and, hung, and hungered or thirst or a stranger or naked or sick? or in prison and did not minister unto thee, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not unto me, and these shall go away into, and I want you to underline these two words, everlasting punishment. Everlasting punishment. One of the fallacies about hell is that it's called the annihilation theory. Did you remember hearing about that? Gary went to seminary, so he's our, I call him our resident scholar. So he's Dr. Gary. The annihilation scenario says that yes, the wicked are turned into hell. They are consumed as a sacrifice in the fires of hell. Once they are consumed, there is nothing left. There is no consciousness. There is no knowledge. There is no awakening. There is nothing left. You are burned up, gone into ashes, and that's the finality of it. Now, I've asked God, in fact, I did. I prayed this before, about two weeks before our house caught on fire. I said, God, I, I just was laying there in bed one night going, what would happen if our house caught on fire? 
God, please, I don't want to die. Burn up in my house. God, do, whatever you've got for me, I do not want to die. Burn up in my house. So God said, okay, you'll live. But if I were going to pick a way to die, burning to death would not be how I would want it. But if you told me that if I don't live for God, that when I die, I'm going to be burnt up and that will be the end of me, to be honest with you, I'd probably take it. I'd probably take it. But when the Bible tells me very clearly and in no uncertain terms that when I die and I am cast into hell fire, that phrase everlasting punishment means that you are punished knowingly for all of eternity. If it lasted 10 years and it was over with, that would be different. If it lasted 100 years and it would be over with, that would be different. If it lasted 500 years and then it was over with and that's the end of it, that might be worth the sins that we commit. But the Bible teaches us plainly that the torment is knowable, you know it's happening, you feel it happening, and it will last forever. And ask yourself the question, do I want to spend my eternity there? We know that the rich man did not just simply die and as our Jehovah's Witness friends tell us, he just lays... See, this is why Charles Taze Russell started the cult of Jehovah's Witness to begin with. He heard a minister preaching from the Bible about hell and the eternity of hell and the everlasting torment and punishment of hell. And he didn't like that. So he set about to, in his mind prove the Bible wrong and prove that all the preachers was wrong and built a religion that said that hell is nothing more than the grave and when you're put there, that's the end of it and there's nothing left for you to go through for all of eternity. That's why he started that. He started it because he was afraid of hell. So he told himself in his mind, I don't believe it anymore. And he just chose not to believe it. That's, that's one fallacy people make. Let's continue reading. Verse 23, Luke 16. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. I don't see Lazarus crying for water. I don't see Lazarus writhing in agony and pain. I see Lazarus in total comfort. Verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. A while back, somebody made me aware that a supposed Christian author, I won't give the name out, but a supposed Christian author had a like a blog or a radio program that was also on the internet or something like that. And one of his guests, one of his featured guests for this particular day was a man who said that he, he, he died. And, and, and people, let me, let me say something to you. Don't buy anybody's books or watch anybody's video that said, I died and went to heaven and God let me come back and boy let me tell you what it's like or I died and I went to hell and I, I, I know what's there and let me tell you what's there. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. One guy said that his daughter 
had a vision from God that there was actually two parts to hell. One was the part where everybody's screaming and burning and everything like that. The other part was like Antarctica. It was all frozen and cold and had ice everywhere and it was full of uh, frozen, dead, lifeless church members. And all the bad church members went to the frozen, I guess hell did freeze over. But he put that out, not only on his radio program, but he put it out in, a, in a, like a newsletter that he put out every month. And I'm going, you're a liar. You're a liar. The Bible says nothing about hell being some cold place. But it sure says it's on fire, doesn't it? And this rich man... There in the flames of hell. Oh, anyway, let me finish the, the, the story. The, the, the guy that supposedly went to hell was giving his story on this radio program and said that he got to hell and he was, it was hot, he was miserable, he was in torments, he was uh, uh, just, just terrified of being there decided that he didn't want to spend eternity there so he cried unto the Lord and God sent an angel down and lifted him up out of hell put him back in his body and he lived now to tell everybody that's a lie What's the biggest lie about that? It gives people, and I wrote the guy, I wrote the, the author and the, the talk show host. Because I read, I read one of his books, it was interesting. But I wrote him. And I said, I'm going to keep this private between me and you. But recently you had this man on your program that said to everybody, every one of your listeners, that according to God, if you die and find yourself in hell and don't like it, you can ask God to save you out of it, and he will. And this talk show host author's response to me was, well, I never said that I agreed with that. That's just what he said. Now, that was a lie because I went back and listened to it, and he's going, wow, this is fascinating. People need to hear this. So, Cubby, if I convince you that once you die and you find yourself in hell, that you can call unto God and God will lift you up out of hell and you don't have to stay there. Is that truth or is that a lie? That's a lie. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. You've got one chance in this world, and it's called life. And whether your life lasts 10 years or your life lasts 100 years, you have that time in this world to get things right with God and appeal to God's mercy. I promise you he'll give it. God is not God a merciful God, Roy. He is a merciful God. He is a loving God. He sent his only begotten son so that you wouldn't have to die and go to hell. By the way, what does the Bible say hell was made for? The devil and his angels. But because of man's fallen state, falling into sin... We'll read this later on, not, not this morning. That the Bible says hell had to enlarge itself because of all the people that are pouring into it. So in verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. I'm sorry, rich man, it's too late for mercy. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water 
and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this what? Flame. Several years, in fact, it's been 20, 25, 30 years ago, something like that. I remember hearing this, about, this way back then. Somebody came up with the idea that the flames of hell were not literal. There's always somebody out there trying to reduce what hell is. They're saying that the flames of hell are not literal flames. That what that represents is the feeling of being absent from the presence of God. And that you have to spend eternity without the presence of God in your life. Baloney. The rich man, I promise you, did not say, I, I want God, I need God, where is God? I, the rich man said, I am tormented in this flame. Lots of people that you know spend their whole life without God and they seem to be enjoying it an awful lot, don't they? Verse 25, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. So let me take this verse and let me ask you a question. Which life would you rather have first? A tormented life here on this earth with a blessed life for eternity or a blessed life now on this earth with a tormented life for eternity. I know it's kind of hard to get that out, but basically it's the first one. I would rather live the tormented life now. Which says, yeah, Hebrews 9.27 is the point. I was thinking Romans for some reason. Hebrews 9.27 for it is a point. Let me, I, there's a context that I want to read for that. I knew that's why I had it in my mind. Yeah, look at this. Turn to Hebrews 10. Or Hebrews 9. All you have to do is go back one page if you knew. In verse 25 it says, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. He's talking about the Old Testament priests and I would say the Catholic priests. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Christ, how many times did Christ die on the cross? Once. Was it worth it? Yes. And not just for him. But for all of mankind it was worth it. Verse 27, and it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Listen, if you, I, I, I mean, I sometimes it, I, I, it bothers me sometimes that I was born in America. When I see the, the misery and the hunger and the torment that other people around the world live daily in their lives with that. When I see those pictures, when I meet those people out in Kenya and see their lives and the hardships that they face and the things that they have to endure, I'm going, man, I want to get back home to America where we got this and we've got that and we've got that and life is good. Sometimes I feel guilty for being born an American. But if I lost it all and had to bear torment and agony and pain 
and suffering the rest of my life. I'd rather do that now and then be relieved of that for eternity in heaven than for me to live my best life now and split hell wide open. Let me finish this. All he wanted was one drop of water to cool his tongue. All he wanted was a fleeting moment of relief. But Abraham, verse 25, said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. You know what he's asking? Let Lazarus come back from the dead. Now that is exactly. And when I asked this lady, was your husband saved or, or not your husband, your brother, was he saved or lost at the time that he died? And she said, lost. I said, then how could he have told you, I'm okay, I'm in a good place now? That was a lie. It was a lie. And I said, it wasn't your brother. It was a familiar spirit who wants you to believe that it was your brother. But according to the Bible, if your brother was lost when he died, he immediately went to hell. Immediately. And so, he wanted him to send him to his father's house. Verse 28, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of what? Torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now, you read what this says. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Hey, let me tell you, one did rise from the dead. His name is Jesus Christ. And he actually went there. He went to the lower parts of the earth and preached to spirits in prison, the good ones and the bad ones. He set Abraham's bosom free and they're in paradise. That's why Jesus said to the thief on the cross this day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And he set them all free and they're in heaven right now. But the rich man is in the same place as the th other thief on the cross. He's in the same place with Pharaoh. He's in the same place with, uh, who else? Cain. He's in the same place as everybody else that died not in faith, turning their hearts away from God. They have been there, some have been there 6,000, some have been there 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 years. Some of them just got there today and they regret it. And like I said earlier, we all have regrets in our life. But I don't want you to regret where you spend eternity. And the time to make that decision, like Sister Betty Walsh, 12 years old, and said to herself, I don't want to go to hell. Is that what you said? You got saved for the same reason I did. I was nine and I couldn't tell you then that I was so in love with God that I just wanted to serve him all my life. That is not why I got saved. I got saved 
because I did not want to go to hell. And that was long, that was 1975. And I still don't want to go to hell. 